a complete departure from the usual starship designs by Starfleet Command, the Olympic class would come into its own as one of the leading medical type starships in the Alpha and Beta quadrants. But what do we know about this unusual class? Well today, we'll find out. Hello and welcome to another episode of Truth or Myth Beta Canon, a Star Trek web series that dives into the history of any given topic, using Beta Canon sources and my own imagination to fill in the gaps. In today's episode, we're taking a look at the Olympic class to better understand its place in Star Trek history. Please note, though this class was first featured in an alternate universe in the TNG series finale All Good Things, it has since become Prime Universe canon with subsequent appearances in the background monitors of Deep Space Nine as well as being seen in Season 1 of Star Trek Lower Decks. But as always, because this is a beta canon video, all information relayed should pretty much be taken with a grain of stardust, and only considered a little bit of Star Trek fun. And so, with all that out of the way, let's begin. After the attack at Wolf 359, Starfleet Command began to scramble for starship designs that could fight and, in theory, defeat the Borg. Over the next decade, classes such as the Defiant, Intrepid, and Sovereign would begin to reshape the Federation's landscape, making Starfleet a powerhouse within the Milky Way galaxy. Up to the 2360s, Starfleet starships were designed with a very general mission parameter in mind. As a result, many of these classes would simply be thrown missions across the entire spectrum, and for the most part that seemed to work out quite well. For example, the Miranda and Excelsior classes would start out with a mission profile of exploration, but then would get a bit of equipment installed into them, and suddenly, these classes would be sent on every type of mission, from cargo runs to patrol duties. Even the cream of the crop starship designs, such as the Galaxy class, at the time could be seen ferrying diplomats, doing cargo runs, simple star mapping missions, and even medical emergency missions. Once Starfleet Command began to settle and plan out its future following the Borg attack in 2367, this general type of mission profile for starship designs would come to an end. In fact, very few starship classes would be equipped for varied mission profiles aside from Starfleet's top-of-the-line designs. And with starship classes being designed for more specific mission profiles in mind, suddenly Starfleet was aware of a huge miss in their starship classes, that being a medical starship design. For a short time, Starfleet considered several other starship designs it had already employed throughout the Federation for potential refit and repurpose as medical starships. But none of these designs really fit the bill for Starfleet Command, as most were known aggressive designs created by Starfleet. To be a true medical starship, this class needed to be clearly different in appearance than any of the starship classes already employed within the fleet and thus the Olympic class was born. Sitting at a length of approximately 350 meters, the Olympic class held 27 decks and designed for a crew of 750 command and medical personnel. For medical emergency situations, the Olympic class could hold up to 2,500 additional passengers. The entire design for this class was inspired by Starfleet's own Daedalus class design which during its early history, Starfleet was considering as a template for its future Starship classes. Though still a general primary and secondary hull configuration like most Starfleet Starships, the Olympic class would contain a sphere for its primary hull rather than the traditional saucer design. This made the class easily recognizable to one and all as a medical class design. It's a common misconception that due to this class's use of a sphere as its primary hull, that it contained more internal space than most other saucer-style starship designs. It simply does not. The math for its internal volume simply does not support this optical illusion. However, its internal arrangement was done in such a way to maximize every available bit of space for the starship. As the class's mission profile suggests, the Olympic class would contain the latest state-of-the-art medical tools and systems. 
In fact, each Starship of the class would be designed to allow for easy refit and update as new medical technologies became available. Given this Starship's medical mission profile, the Olympic class would not be that well armed, having only three phaser arrays and two photon torpedo launchers installed. Also substantially different in this class was its navigational deflector systems. Rather than a standard dish-style deflector, the Olympic class would contain more of a strip-style one, based on deflector emitters utilized within the Oberth and Miranda classes. Again, due to its mission profile, its warp drive, though still state-of-the-art, was not rated for immense speeds. The Olympic class's standard cruising speed was only that of Warp Factor 6, though in extreme emergencies, it could reach speeds of up to Warp 9.2, though only for six hours at a time. Though equipped with standard transporter systems of the time, the transporters in this class could easily be reconfigured to allow for large-scale transports, along with highly specific biofilter capabilities. This class would also include several isolation areas, which could be completely cut off from the rest of the starship, and even jettisoned if necessary. In fact, the entire sphere section of the starship could be jettisoned and its secondary hull used as a life craft should a lethal contamination or outbreak occur. This had the effect of allowing the medical personnel within the primary hull to continue to treat and attempt to cure said situations up to the last possible moment. Though it should be noted that once detached, the primary hull could not be simply reattached like the Galaxy or Prometheus classes, rather needing a Starbase's assistance to do so. However, the secondary hull was capable of tractor towing its primary hull at low warp to a Starfleet facility. The Olympic class also contained a large aft shuttle bay filled with specially designed medical shuttles for missions where the transporter systems would not operate. All starships of the Olympic class, apart from the prototype, the USS Olympic herself, would be named after famous doctors from throughout the Federation and its history. Also, the outer hull of the starship class would contain several markings to denote its medical mission profile. The Olympic class began full production by 2369, and by the Dominion War were being used as mobile hospital units for the front line. Starships could unload their injured personnel to an Olympic-class vessel, and rest assured knowing that these crew members would get the best possible medical care. During the Dominion War, Starfleet crew members themselves were at a premium, and as such, the Olympic-class would end up relying on its expanded and extensive emergency medical holographic system. This allowed for each of the starships to have fewer medical personnel assigned to them, while at the same time ensuring around-the-clock monitoring of patients with no loss of efficiency due to exhaustion. Though these medical holograms would be updated and changed many times during the class's lifetime due to constant complaints of the EMH's terrible bedside manner. When the Romulan star system was destroyed in 2387, Starfleet Command would send three of its Olympic-class vessels into Romulan territory to assist with survivors of the tragedy while it mobilized its remaining Olympic-class vessels to join the rescue effort. However, all three starships would be destroyed by a Romulan mining vessel adapted with Borg technology, as its commander, a Romulan named Nero, blamed the Federation for Romulus's destruction. Though a task force was sent by Starfleet to apprehend Nero, led by the USS Enterprise, they were unable to find any sign of the starship, and the investigation would be closed a decade later, believing that Nero had destroyed his own starship in the same short-lived anomaly that had claimed the life of Ambassador Spock. Starfleet would continue to be impressed by the Olympic class's design, so much so that this class of starship would survive well into the 26th century receiving periodic massive refits and upgrades during its run. But by the early 2520s, the class was beginning to show its age, and as a result, Starfleet would finally make the decision to decommission the class, though Starfleet would decide to donate many of these starships to its outer colonies to augment their own planetary defenses, 
with most of these vessels being modified to contain more firepower. Though perhaps not the most glamorous end to a Starship class with such a heroic and important role in Federation history, the Olympic class has nevertheless earned its place in Starfleet history, proving for all time that hero Starship classes don't always have to be exploring the unknown or making contact with new civilizations, rather simply helping those in need. Thank you for watching today's episode of Truth or Myth Beta Canon. What do you think of the Olympic class and the historical narrative I've created here? Would you like to see more videos like this one? Well, leave your comments in the section below, and don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel, hitting that little bell icon so you won't miss a single video we release. Want to help this channel cure plagues released on the galaxy? Then consider becoming a channel patron. The link to our Patreon account is in the description below. Thanks again for watching, live long, and prosper.